Hello, welcome to Willow Hill and everyone joining us for worship today. We are so blessed to worship with you. My name is Lee Hager. I'm the director of online ministries, and I'm excited to welcome you to week two of our sermon series, Gleanings from Ruth. This week, Pastor Nicole is sharing the message, Ruth 2. If you are new here or a returning online worshiper, welcome. We're so glad you're here, and we would love a chance to get to know you a little bit better. Uh, you can go ahead and fill out the digital connection card, which is linked in the video's description, or you can scan the QR code on the screen. Like I said, it would give us a chance to get to know you a little bit better, and it's an opportunity for you to submit any prayer requests you might have so the staff can pray alongside you. We would also encourage you to pull out your cell phone or tablet and join us in the comments. We would love to hear with you and engage with you there. Uh, you can tell us anything you like, any insights you might have. Uh, pulling out your cell phone or tablet will also allow you to scan any QR codes that might pop up on your screen throughout the worship service. And we would encourage you to like this worship service and share it with someone you think might be blessed by it. If you'd like to get to know Willow Hill a little bit more, you can check out our website, willowhill.org, or you can find us on social media through Facebook, Instagram, and our YouTube channel. At this time, we encourage everyone to lift their voices as we sing our opening song. friends, as we enter into our time of prayer, I want to invite you to just take in a deep breath, relax yourself. 
I will pray a prayer for us, and at the end we can join together in praying the Lord's Prayer. Let us go to God. O oh God, we gather this day with hearts ready to worship you. We give thanks for your love and grace, which is far greater than our minds could ever imagine. We give thanks that through all of our struggles, you are with us. As we are gathered from wherever we are, many of our hearts are heavy. We are carrying great burdens with us, worries, anxieties, stress, illness, grief. Help us to lay them down at your feet this morning. Help us to recognize that you are God and we are not, and that we cannot carry these burdens alone, and we need only to rely on you. Give us peace and comfort when we don't know what to do next. As we examine our hearts today, we see the things that we've done wrong, things that we have done and left undone, things that we have said and haven't said. We know that there are people whom we have hurt, people whom we have failed, and we know that we haven't always done what you've asked us to do. We have decided sometimes that our ways are better than yours. Forgive us, we pray. Free us to follow your perfect will for our lives. And we pray, oh God, that you would guide our steps this week. We lift up this prayer to you in the name of the one who showed us the way and who taught us how to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Hi, friends. It is time for small talk. I brought a picture with me today that I want to show you. Are you ready? All right, here it is. Isn't it a fun picture? What? You can't see my picture? Well, I used a crayon and I drew a picture on here. I got it. I have a marker here. I wonder if this marker will help us see the picture because I drew the picture, I really did. It's right here. But let's try the marker and see if this will help us see it because I, I see it now. You, you can't see the picture, can you? But watch what happens if I use a marker. Uh-oh, are you starting to see something? Look at that. Look, there's something there. If I keep coloring. Look, now you can see it. See, there really was a picture under there. Except I drew that picture with a white crayon, so you couldn't see it at first, could you? We had to pull out a marker, and it also works with paints, with watercolor paints. You can do this too. You draw a picture with a white crayon, and it looks like an invisible picture. It looks like a plain sheet of paper. But then you pull out a marker or some paints, and you color over it, and your picture appears. Now you can see it. Isn't that fun? You could try that at home sometime. But you know, I did that today because I was thinking, sometimes it's hard for us to see what God is doing around us, right? Sometimes we might look around and think, where is God? We can't see God. We can't see how God is working in our lives very well if we just look, right? But if we do something special and we try to really train our eyes and train our ears to listen to, to look for the good in the world. So if there's something bad happening, it's hard to see where God might be working, right? Where sometimes it's easy to forget that God is with us. But when something is happening, something bad, or even just a regular day, you can look for people that are helping, 
look for ways that people are being kind and loving other people. Look for things that happen that bring you joy. Look for all that good in the world. And when you see good, when you see people doing good or being kind or you just have that wonderful feeling where you feel like things are good and I'm happy, God is with you at that time. God is working through those things. And when we're sad and life isn't going very well, whenever a person comes to help or a person says something kind or you just get a feeling that, okay, I can get through this day. I'm going to wake up with another new day tomorrow. The sun shines. All those things, when you look at those things, you can see that that is God at work because God is always at work in our lives. Even when we can't see God, we can still know that just like we couldn't see this flower at first, it was there. We just had to do something special to see it. God is always there with you. We just have to try to focus and look for the good, look for ways that we feel not alone, the people around us that love us and care for us, the people that are caring for others, the nice things that you see people do. That is where God is at work in our lives. All right, let's fold our hands and say our sentence prayer. Dear God, thank you for guiding us through good and bad days. Help us look for you in the people around us. Amen. See you next time. Well, our mission statement here at Willow Hill is to gather people in the name of Jesus Christ, grow disciples and equip them for personal ministry and go into our community and world to share the transforming power of God's love. All that we do at Willow Hill seeks to follow under that mission statement, to gather, to grow, to go. We hope that all that we do glorifies God and seeks to share God's love with others. And we're only able to do any of it because of your generosity. When you give to the mission of Willow Hill, you are helping us to gather, to grow, and to go, to make a difference in the name of Jesus Christ in our world. So we invite you to give to that mission today. You can do so by using the QR code on the screen. There's also a link in the description of this video. Or if you'd rather mail in a check or drop it by the church office, that is welcomed as well. However you give, know that you're making a difference and we are grateful for you. your body.
Would you pray with me, please? Oh God, we pray that you would open our ears that we might hear your still, small voice. Speak to us, God. We are listening. Amen. Well, have you ever had a chance meeting? You ever had that moment where out of the blue you met somebody who ended up being a significant part of your life? Sometimes that happens, right? Sophomore year of college, my dear friend Jenny transferred schools. We had met freshman year at Illinois Wesleyan, but she transferred the next year to Greenville College. Now, it just so happened that I was off on my Christmas break a little bit before hers started. And so I decided to visit her at school. And so I made plans with her boyfriend, Jared, to surprise her at a Christmas party that Jared and his roommates were going to be hosting in their dorm room. <laughs> so I made my way to Greenville, having no idea that my life would never be the same. When I got to the dorm, I surprised Jenny, which was really fun, and I also met Jared's roommates. One of his roommates was a fella by the name of Steve Cox. It was a chance meeting. But as I look back on it now, I know it was more than just luck that got me there. I believe it was God working behind the scenes. Today we're going to take a look at a story in the Bible where there's a chance meeting. But when we look at it closely, we know that it is God working behind the scenes. But before we get into it, I want to recap the story thus far. Last week, we kicked off our sermon series, Gleanings from Ruth, and we started reading through the book of Ruth, verse by verse, and here's what happened. Naomi, her husband, and her two children moved to another country, to Moab, in order to avoid the famine that's happening in Bethlehem. But things just get worse. Naomi's husband dies and leaves her as a widow. Her two sons marry two Moabite women, Orpah and Ruth. And then the unthinkable happens. Both of Naomi's sons die. And so Naomi is just wrought with grief. And she decides to move back home to Bethlehem to surround herself with friends and family that they had left more than a decade before. Ruth and Orpah follow their mother-in-law, but Naomi insists that they go home. Orpah turns back. Ruth does not. In a bold move of love and loyalty, Ruth vows to stay with Naomi. And so they return to Bethlehem, though they are broken, empty, and overwhelmed with grief. So let's see what happens next for our two grieving widows and I invite you to follow along. If you have a Bible handy, you can open that up to Ruth chapter 2 or in your Bible app on your phone. You can use that as well. This is Ruth chapter 2 verses 1 and following. I'm reading from the Common English Bible, the CEB version. Now, Naomi had a respective relative, a man of worth, through her husband from the family of Elimelech. His name was Boaz. Ruth, the Moabite, said to Naomi, let me go to the field so that I may glean among the ears of grain before some, behind someone in whose eyes I might find favor. And Naomi replied to her, go, my daughter. So we start out with this brief mention of a man named Boaz, and he's going to come back around in a bit. But the more pressing matter here is that Ruth and Naomi are hungry. They've moved back to Bethlehem, but they have no food, no one to provide them with food. So Ruth decides to take matters into her own hands. Who else is going to provide for them? So she asks Naomi's permission to go and glean in a field to collect grain behind a harvester. Now, this is an important part of the Old Testament law. You see, there was this provision in the law that said that farmers were to leave the edges of their fields unharvested. That area of the field was to be left for the poor, the widows, the orphans, the foreigners. And they could go and glean food from the edges of the field. 
Similarly, when a farmer was done harvesting the field, he wasn't allowed to go back and pick up what he had dropped along the way. That too was for the less fortunate. This was kind of the ancient Israelite welfare system. This is how they took care of those in need. The law, however, doesn't specify how large the unharvested edges of the field need to be. The law didn't specify how thoroughly workers should harvest or if they should purposely leave some grain behind to help those in need. This was just left up to the individual farmer to wrestle with and to figure out. And as we continue to read, we're going to get a better feel for this. In her book, Finding God in the Margins, Carolyn Custis James points this out. In an ancient Near Eastern shame-based culture, gleaning was a source of shame. It was a public display of poverty. In Israel, for someone like Naomi, who was once a respected member of the Bethlehem community, it must have been a blow to her sense of dignity for her daughter-in-law to join the ranks of gleaners. So we see that maybe Naomi isn't so excited about sending Ruth off, but what choice does she have? And you know, perhaps it isn't so different these days. As the middle class continues to shrink in our country, we are seeing more and more people needing to take advantage of food pantries and government assistance. I continue to be so proud of the work that we do here at Willow Hill to keep our local food pantries stocked. For those who are in need, they can find some help there. We have a table in our entryway that is almost always laden with food. And and for us, that's kind of like the unharvested edges of an ancient field. It's a way that we take care of one another, a way that we share what we have with those in need. Well, let's keep reading. This is verse 3 and following. So she went. And she arrived and she gleaned in the field behind the harvesters. By chance, it happened to be the portion of the field that belonged to Boaz, who was from the family of Elimelech. Just then, Boaz arrived from Bethlehem and he said to the harvesters, May the Lord be with you. And they said to him, May the Lord bless you. Boaz said this to his young man, the one who was overseeing the harvesters. To whom does this young woman belong? The young man who was overseeing the harvesters answered, She's a young Moabite woman, the one who returned with Naomi from the territory of Moab. She said, Please let me glean so that I might gather up grain from among the bundles behind the harvesters. She arrived and has been on her feet from the morning until now. She has only sat down for a moment. So by chance, Ruth finds herself in the field of Boaz, the same guy that was mentioned at the beginning of this chapter. He is a relative of Elimelech. That's Naomi's deceased husband. But what we are going to see in this chapter is that it doesn't happen by chance. This is the hand of God working in the background. Now, this is one of the interesting things about the book of Ruth. God isn't front and center in this book. But if we pay attention, we see that God is very much a part of this story. So Boaz arrives at his field and he notices Ruth. And so he asks his foreman who she is. And the foreman explains that she's been gleaning and working very hard all day. And we see that Ruth is really serious about finding a way to feed herself and Naomi. She isn't afraid of hard work, even if it's manual labor. But here's the thing about Ruth. She's also super courageous. As a young, unaccompanied widow in the ancient world, this situation could have gone very differently for her. Carolyn Custis James points this out in her book, She tells us that Ruth faced danger from the other hungry gleaners who were in the field. You can imagine that those gleaners would not have been excited to share this field with yet another person who is taking crops. Another gleaner meant less food for them. 
The other danger that she faced was from the hired hands in the field. It was not uncommon for these hired hands to pull rank and mistreat the gleaners. Ruth would have been defenseless against these men. But by the grace of God, it seems that Ruth has found herself in a safe place and no one has harmed her. She has been allowed to glean grain for her family. And everyone, it seems, has left her alone to do that. Let's read on. This is verse 8. Boaz said to Ruth, Haven't you understood, my daughter? Don't go glean in another field. Don't go anywhere else. And said, Stay here with my young women. Keep your eyes on the field that they are harvesting and go along after them. I've ordered the young men not to assault you. Whenever you are thirsty, go to the jugs and drink from what the young men have filled. Then she bowed down, face to the ground, and replied to him, How is it that I have found favor in your eyes that you notice me? I am an immigrant. And Boaz responded to her, Everything that you did for your mother-in-law after your husband's death has been reported fully to me. How you left behind your father, your mother, and the land of your birth and came to a people you hadn't known beforehand. May the Lord reward you for your deed. May you receive a rich reward from the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you come to seek refuge. She said, may I continue to find favor in your eyes, sir, because you've comforted me and because you've spoken kindly to your female servant, even though I'm not one of your female servants. So we find here that Boaz has heard of Ruth. He knows what she has done for Naomi, sticking by her side in the midst of deep grief. And it's obvious that he's impressed with her and grateful that she has shown kindness to Naomi. So he tells Ruth to keep gleaning in the field. He tells her that she can drink from the water that is provided for his workers. He makes sure that the hired hands won't bother her and that she will be safe. This Boaz guy is a pretty okay dude. <laughs> but that's not all he does for Ruth. So let's keep reading. This is verse 14 and following. At mealtime, Boaz said to her, come over here and eat some of the bread and dip your piece in the vinegar. So she sat alongside the harvesters and he served roasted grain to her. She ate, was satisfied and had leftovers. Then she got up to glean. Boaz ordered his young men, let her glean between the bundles and don't humiliate her. Also pull out some of the, from the bales for her and leave them behind for her to glean. And don't scold her. So she gleaned in the field until evening. Then she threshed what she had gleaned. And it was about an ephah of barley. So lunchtime rolls around. Boaz invites Ruth to eat with him, provides a meal for her. And then tells the hired hands to make sure that Ruth's gleaning is easier. He tells them to purposely leave behind more grain so that she can collect enough food for her and Naomi to eat. It's really quite kind of Boaz, isn't it? Though he could have just given her grain and not made her work for it. But perhaps Boaz had an inkling that Ruth wouldn't, wouldn't accept a handout, that she'd be too proud to do that. Who knows? But what we can see is that Boaz is going above and beyond to help Ruth out. He sees Ruth not as a foreigner, as an immigrant, but as somebody who's worthy of receiving his help. Boaz really shows us the importance of taking care of one another. He has seen how good Ruth has been to his relative's wife, Naomi. He has seen how Ruth has worked hard to provide food for her. He has seen an opportunity here to help out Ruth and Naomi by providing a little bit more grain for them to eat. What a reminder for us. You know, we have a sacred trust to care for one another in our community. We are called by God to love one another, to walk alongside one another, to help one another out. 
And Boaz shows us that this is something that should be on the forefront of our minds. Boaz sacrificed some of his prophets in order to provide for Ruth and Naomi. And he reminds us that people are more important than prophets. By the end of the day, with a lot of hard work and a little help from Boaz, Ruth collects an ephah of barley. Now, this is an incredible amount of food for her to have collected in one day. It would have been enough to feed her and Naomi for an entire week. Can you imagine how proud and excited she must have felt after that day's work? And she's about to go home to show Naomi what happened. Now, we have to remember, Naomi was most likely feeling pretty humiliated that Ruth had to go out and glean in the first place. I also think she's probably worried sick about Ruth because she's been gone the entire day. Let's see her reaction to Ruth's haul of grain. This is verse 18 and following. <clears throat> she picked it up and went into town. Her mother-in-law saw what she had gleaned. She brought out what she had left over after eating her fill and gave it to her. Her mother-in-law said to her, where did you glean today? Where did you work? May the one who noticed you be blessed. She told her mother-in-law with whom she had worked and said, the name of the man with whom I work today is Boaz. Now Naomi is shocked at what Ruth has returned home with. Surely her worry about Ruth and her worry about what they will eat has subsided at least for a moment. And she wants to know all about Ruth's day. Where did you glean? Whose field was it? What was it like? Whoever let you take this much grain is amazing. And Ruth tells Naomi, I worked for a man named Boaz. Now remember, she has no idea that Boaz is related to her father-in-law. She isn't aware that she stumbled into the field of family. But Naomi knows Boaz. And let's see what she has to say about Boaz as we finish up our chapter. This is verse 20 and following. Naomi replied to her daughter-in-law, May he be blessed by the Lord who hasn't abandoned his faithfulness with the living or with the dead. Naomi said to her, The man is one of our close relatives. He's one of our redeemers. Now a quick note about this redeemer thing. You might remember we talked a little bit about it last week, how the law taught that if your husband died, you were to marry his brother in order to make sure that you were provided for. If you didn't have a brother to marry, then you would marry the next closest relative. This was called a kinsman redeemer or a redeemer is what it's mentioned as in our translation today. We're going to learn more about this as our story continues over the next couple of weeks. Let's wrap up the chapter. This is verse 21 through the end. Ruth, the Moabite, replied, Furthermore, he has said to me, Stay with my workers until they finish all my harvest. Naomi said to Ruth, her daughter-in-law, It's good, my daughter, that you go out with his young women so that the men don't assault you in another field. Thus she stayed with Boaz's young women, gleaning until the completion of the barley and wheat harvests, and she lived with her mother-in-law. So we kind of wrap up this chapter seeing a day in the life of Ruth. What a difference a day makes. Ruth and Naomi start out the day empty and hungry. They end the day full and satiated. And it seems that even Naomi's bitterness and grief have given away at least a little bit to gratitude and joy. Perhaps she is seeing God's provision in her life. Perhaps she's seeing that God has been with her all along, even in her deepest suffering and grief. And really, isn't that what this chapter is all about, that God is at work? Surely God led Ruth to Boaz's field. Surely it was God who kept Ruth safe from harm as she gleans. We see God at work softening Naomi's heart after her long season of grief and pain. 
We see God at work through Boaz and his generosity towards Naomi and Ruth. God is very much present in the story. Sometimes we just have to look to see it. And sometimes in our lives, it's the same with us. Sometimes we might think that God has abandoned us, that God is nowhere to be found. Like Naomi, we may blame God for the suffering that we've had to endure. And those emotions are completely normal to have. However, if we look, really look, I think sometimes we can see that God has been at work in our lives. Perhaps not in overt and obvious ways, but behind the scene, orchestrating good in our lives. Just like he did for Ruth and Naomi. But sometimes we miss it because we forget to look for God. We just keep chugging away in our lives and we forget to see what God is up to. Instead, I wonder how much we might be blessed if we took time to look for God's work in our lives. Where is it that we see evidence of God? What bears the fingerprints of God? If we open our eyes and unstop our ears and prepare our hearts, maybe we'd be surprised by all the ways that God is working in our lives. So this week, I'd like to challenge you to set apart a little bit of time. Pick a day. Maybe, maybe it's a half hour, maybe it's an hour, maybe it's a few hours that you just stop and meditate on this. Pray for God to reveal to you how he has been at work. Pray for God to show you the places where he has been moving things in your life. I wonder if we might be surprised by what we learn. So may God make himself known and may we take the opportunity to recognize that God is working in our lives. Would you pray with me, please? Oh God, as we read the story of Ruth and Naomi, we are reminded that you are at work even when we can't see it. In our lives, we pray that you would help us to open our eyes to be more aware of the ways that you are working, of how you are orchestrating the good in our lives, helping to put us back together when we feel broken and empty. We pray, God, that this week you would help us to see those places where you have been at work and are at work and help us to be grateful for the ways that you are working in our lives. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. Well, this worship service has ended, but your life in Christ goes on and on. May your peace be so real and your joy so evident that all who see you come to know God. Amen.